times better. We're hearing that there are dozens of attempts at vaccines all around the world. Are they all different? Uh, most of them are, are. I think we can uh, sort of group them in, uh, um, in, in different types. Uh, and uh, so, for example, if we, if we think about the one that has been mentioned so many times because it's a UK product, it's the Oxford vaccine, that actually uses a different uh, virus uh, and then attaches it on top uh, one of the bits of this virus. And therefore, it's, uh, it's likely to be uh, very safe because, uh, or at least that's the expectations, because it's not related uh, at all, like the, the, the virus, this coronavirus. There are other viruses, that, other vaccines, that actually just use the genetic material of, um, of to make uh, some of the proteins, some of the building blocks of the viruses. So there are very different ways of approaching the vaccines. There's also different way of manufacturing them. And so what, what's the difference between the sort of the two big British projects that we're hearing about in Oxford and Imperial? One make use of uh, a, what is called a viral vector, which is an adenovirus. Uh, and they actually have been used quite su successfully for other viruses, including MERS, which is a relative of, uh, of this coronavirus. And the, um, the, the London, the Imperial um, uh, vaccine is more about genetic material that is given to our cells. And then they do the job about building up the picture to present to your immune system. Paul, is, is that what, what you're involved in and how confident are you of it? So the, the Imperial vaccine is, is happening in the department where, where, I, where I work at Imperial. And um, uh, like many of the vaccines at the moment, it works in animals. And that's a fantastic start. Um, the real proof of the pudding is when you put it into humans. And, uh, and these are new types of vaccines. There is evidence from others that uh, these nucleic acid vaccines can work. But I think what Elizabeth has just described um, uh, leads into that question of what are the hurdles when you have many different types of vaccines that are out there, how you manufacture these at scale are all different. Now, when we know what we're doing, and we know what we're doing with things like influenza, for seasonal influenza, we can make um, globally um, over one and a half billion doses in a year. And because that's a common pipeline and we know what we're doing, if there was ever a pandemic of influenza, the WHO estimates that you can scale up surge capacity, if you like, from that one and a half billion to about six billion. But that's because it's all the same type of vaccine, all of the plant, all of the manufacturing, all the regulatory bodies are all aligned of knowing what to do. That doesn't apply to the coronavirus vaccines at the moment. Um, they're new. Um, some of them are based on existing technology, but how you scale these is not that straightforward. And that's why these things like the task force are going to be so important. Sir Paul, uh, or rather Paul, um, how, how do we make this quicker? I think that um, what we have to do is look at the regulation, look at the process, look at the workflow, and see what we can do at this time of crisis in actually putting things in parallel so we can get things working more um, rapidly than is the normal case. If you like, the influenza is on a sort of um, railway track. They know how it works. They know how it does, as Paul uh, uh, explained. We're in a novel situation. We may have to cut corners, do things in parallel, do things a bit differently. And maybe that isn't always so easy in um, this sort of process type situation. We need imagination and the will to actually deliver something more rapidly. And that does require thinking more outside the box. Um, so, Sinetra, we've heard about your colleagues in Oxford working on the vaccine that they say they'll be starting to, to, to use in September. How, how can they get it ready by then? Uh, well, again, that's actually just the same question. Will they be able to put the processes in place in parallel to jump through those regulatory hurdles and the manufacturing bottlenecks? Um, in terms of whether it's going to work, which is kind of the bigger question for most of us, um, I'm pretty confident it will. Why? Well, I often um, start talks by asking why we have a vaccine against measles but not against HIV. And the answer to that is because what we recognise uh, when we're infected with measles, the bits of the virus that we see are located in its receptor binding site and perform a vital function so that altering those bits um, reduces its functionality in a way that makes it unfeasible. And I think the coronavirus belongs to that kind of category of pathogen. Whereas with HIV and flu, 
the parts that we direct our attention to immunologically are able to change. And very fortunately for us, that doesn't apply to coronavirus. Dina? I'm amazed at the, at the speed um, and the efficiency with which a whole range of different vaccine initiatives have taken off um, in response to this new infection. And I think that is one of the success stories of the many years of pandemic planning that many organizations, including the WHO and others, have, 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 um, have been focusing on. Um, and there, is there were ways of, of channeling resource um, uh, into, the, into these initiatives. So I think, I think the hopes are really um, high. Having said that, um, uh, it, I, am, I am often challenged by when I see scientists saying a vaccine will be ready by September. Of course, for a scientist to say a vaccine will be ready doesn't mean for you and I we can go to our local GP and get a shot of that vaccine. And I think there, and, and again, I, I can see that politicians are taking on some of those misconceptions. Um, and, and my worry is, um, unfulfilled hopes here. Um, it's very likely that if a vaccine does show to be safe, and that's a big question of safety, as well as efficacious in terms of preventing, um, uh, protecting individuals from this virus, that may very, very well take another 12 months. I, I just want to ask you, I mean, who should get it? You know, in what order? Oh, well, this is, uh, this is actually going to depend uh, on the type of vaccine and on the safety profile. And we know that, uh, for example, the Oxford vaccine that is going to start uh, uh, what is called phase one. Obviously, phase one is going to go into healthy volunteers between the age of 18 and 50. And if we now think about uh, what's the high-risk age groups uh, that we always talk about with the coronavirus, which are much older, you know, over 65. So we're going to need to wait a little bit longer to have those safety profiles actually so that data that we need to actually protect with a vaccine you know the, the most vulnerable people. So Paul Nurse um, I mean are we too risk averse when it comes to vaccine in this situation? I think generally as a society we have got a bit risk averse in developing new treatments. I think that um, we, uh, we worry so much about these things that perhaps we throw babies out with the bathwater. Just to put uh, an example which is completely outside this issue, I think if aspirin were invented today it would be a, a prescription drug and it's only because it's been around so long that it is not. And perhaps we do need to look at these uh, regulations and the hoops we have to go through whilst being cautious just to see if they're all entirely appropriate, especially in the circumstances we have today. Paul, um, can, can, can you just sort of address this question of how we roll this out and who should get it in what order? You need to look at two things in my mind. Um, those that are most in need of the vaccine and where it's been demonstrated that it can have an effect. And those populations where by vaccinating them, you have a additive effect because you're creating more immunity in a particular group of people that may be more likely to be vectors and spreading of the infection at a time. So we've got to be really clever with this. We've got to think carefully and think outside of the normal paradigm of how you would do um, vaccine or any other treatment development. 